This week's episode of our show has been sponsored by Stibble's Codex of Companions, which is now available for pre-order at the Ghostfire Games online store. Designed by our amazing friend Logan at RuneSmith, this book is jam-packed full of crazy critters to add to your games. Your characters can befriend these companions and follow them on their adventures. So for all of you that have a party that is notorious for building up a small menagerie of adorable followers, this is the perfect way to get some rules for that so that you can control the chaos that such creatures bring. So you can add all of these fun and adorable little monsters to your adventuring party by pre-ordering the book using the links below. Stibble's Codex is coming off the rails of a fantastically successful Kickstarter campaign and is now coming up for pre-order for its eventual delivery very soon. So check out that pre-order in the description below. And now, onto this week's episode. Greetings, my name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. Welcome to our channel, where we cover everything Dungeons & Dragons, including advice for players and guides for dungeon masters. We upload new videos on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so please subscribe to the channel so that you never miss an episode. Today, we are ranking the subclasses available to Artificers in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. Although the Artificer originally appeared in the Eberron Sourcebook with three subclasses, a fourth subclass, the Armorer, was introduced in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, so we will be evaluating all four of the subclasses based on how they are presented in Tasha's Cauldron. If you look on the screen right now, you're going to see the criteria that we use to rank the subclasses. We've pitted the subclasses against each other and not those of other classes. Also keep in mind that we will not be taking the roleplay or flavor that you bring to your Artificer into account with these rankings. Also, we might touch on some multi-classing, but it is not a core mechanic that we are looking at in our rankings. It is worth noting that when we evaluate the subclasses, we look at more than just combat. We consider how the subclass augments the features of the base class in exploration encounters, problem solving, and social situations as well. One of the key things with all the Artificer subclasses, though, is that many of them do have a pretty strong combat bent although some of them cause the Artificer to diverge from roles from being a damage dealer to being a support character to even being a little bit of a frontliner as well. The Artificer is also the newest class introduced in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition, and the subclasses overall we feel are far more balanced against each other compared to those of prior classes. With only four subclasses presented for the base class and this later set of design principles being applied to it, Overall, we think that the Artificer subclasses are much closer to each other, even as we go into the analysis. There's a lot to discuss today, so let's get rolling. So as we dive in, there are two main features that are common to all of the Artificer subclasses. The first of which is that all Artificer subclasses grant an additional set of tool proficiencies and sometimes additional weapon and armor proficiencies, often allowing the various Artificer subclasses to use those tools or weapons as a spellcasting focus for their Artificer spells. In addition to that, Artificers do gain an, an extended spell list for each of the subclasses. This works basically in the same manner as the expanded spell list available to clerics, in which that artificers gain two spells of each level from first to fifth level that they always have prepared and don't count against their spells known. So let's kick things off by looking at the Alchemist subclass that was introduced. The Alchemist is the master of potions. Now, if you're looking for exploding potions and blowing up the battlefield by hucking vials at your enemies, this isn't quite what you're going to get here. This is more the potion creator who is giving out potions to the rest of the team and using them themselves to amplify and bolster the party. That said, the spell list for the Alchemist does have some cool options for spells that feel like explosive alchemical concoctions. The spell list includes spells like Healing Word and Raise Dead, but also spells like Flaming Sphere, Gaseous Form, and Cloud Kill. So you do get a little bit of that flavor of throwing out some sort of volatile mixture, but it actually comes in the form of the spells. Looking at the overall spell list though given to the Alchemist, I give this a 4 out of 10 overall. Yeah, four, 4 or 5 out of 10. I feel like there are some really cool spells here, but there are other ones that I could give or take. Having an expanded spell list is never a bad thing, and I'm sure you can find uses for a lot of these, but overall, I won't say it's the greatest spell list presented to the Artificers. 
it said it does have a few really great spells and having healing word on an artificer is one of the best spells in the game it's really really useful and so i'm not gonna knock getting that spell <laughs> When you take the subclass at third level, you're going to gain Experimental Elixir, and this is kind of the bread and butter of the entire subclass. So now every time that you finish a long rest, you can create a magical potion. If you do this, it is randomly determined from the table presented in the book. However, you can also use a spell slot of first level or higher to create the potion of your choice, and then you can take it yourself or give it to a companion. These potions last until they are consumed or until you take another long rest. So they have a very short lifespan, so you can't really stockpile them. But as you gain levels, you are able to create more when you finish a long rest. But the ones that you create when you finish a long rest are always determined randomly by rolling on the table. It's only when you expend a spell slot that you get to choose the effect. The, the effects vary and last from anywhere from one minute to an hour. They include effects like adding a d4 to attack rolls and saving throws, gaining a very small but significant flying speed, increasing your speed, and also healing potions and the ability to transform your shape. What's interesting about all of these is that these often mimic the effects of several spells like Cure Wounds or Fly or Bless or Alter Self in a slightly reduced capacity. But what's notable is that they don't require concentration. And I think even blowing a first level spell slot on creating the potion of your choice, which is giving you a smaller version of the spell, but without the limitations of concentration, is a really key component for a spellcaster to keep in mind. At fifth level, you gain Alchemical Savant, and now any spell that you cast that either is a healing spell or a damaging spell that does uh, acid, fire, necrotic, or poison damage, you get to add your intelligence modifier to it. At level nine, you gain the Restorative Reagents feature. Anytime someone consumes one of your experimental elixirs, they gain a number of temporary hit points equal to 2d6 plus your intelligence modifier, and you can also cast lesser restoration a number of times per day equal to your intelligence modifier without expending a spell slot. At 15th level, you gain chemical mastery. You are now immune to the poison condition, resistant to poison and acid damage, and you can cast greater restoration or heal once per day without expending a spell slot or requiring material components. Well, I'm a little bit disappointed that the alchemist doesn't throw fireballs and, and come up with more of the explosive side of the alchemist area, this is a pretty decent support class. There's a pr the ability to gain effects like Bless, Flight, or even just make up a couple extra healing potions that you can give to your party members, has some interesting implications for concentration limitations and the action economy. And I think that the, the features here meld pretty nicely with the Artificer Infusions in a pretty neutral way. It definitely feels like a character that's going to be creating potions and giving them out to the rest of the party on a very regular basis. You get to do it a lot. You can use your spell slots, which is a pretty significant limitation, but that's a fine one. I just don't think that anything here jumps out to me as particularly amazing. I think that that's, that's the only thing. If you enjoy that play style of supporting your allies, giving them out potions, and making everyone else around you feel awesome, and patching them up when they get beat up, I think that this does a very respectable job of that and will combine well with the other Artificer base features. It doesn't really augment any of the other artificer based features so much as it's giving you new ways to do things that you probably could have already done, um, w but with, with a potion sort of theme. So overall for me, this is a solid B. Um, I, I think that a creative player could probably take this as an, in an interesting direction and play a pr really, really solid healer with it um, and bring in a lot of important buffs and I'd be interested to see how this might combine with some of the infusions and the other spells of the Artificer. So I think a B is very appropriate comparatively speaking with the ca capabilities of the Artificer class and compared to the other subclasses available. I'm willing to uh, agree with that assessment. I do think that this is a B subclass. Uh, I, I actually really like the idea of this subclass. Uh, and I think that it offers a really unique play style. When I look at what I want my Artificer to be able to do, this one does seem the least exciting to me, but still I think that I would have a great time playing mm. this character. And 
uh, whipping potions around to blow things up is a really cool idea that I wish had been implemented here. But at the same time, I can just say that all my spells are potion bottles that I'm throwing into battle. Yeah. So there, there is still that element that I am a spellcaster and I can kind of decide what I want to do with that. As in terms of being a support utility character, this does offer something pretty unique. Do I think it's the most powerful option? No. Do I think that in the hands of the right player at the right table, it could be amazing? Sure. I think that there's a lot of fun to be had here. I, I do agree that all the abilities, there's not a single one that I read and go, oh, that, that ability sucks. But every one that I read, I go, oh, that's neat. And it really doesn't do much more than be pretty neat. Uh, so a B ranking, I think, is is very suitable for this subclass. If you had a party of four characters, you could expend all your first level spell slots to give everybody in the party flight for 10 minutes or give everybody in the party some sort of alter self transformation for 10 minutes as well. I mean, you're blowing all your spell slots to do it. So there is, it's not without cost and it is limited to 10 minutes. So it's powerful, but there are reasonable limits on, on, on the feature. There, there's some power there and some implications for exploration uh, and problem solving, which I think is something that is quite unique for the alchemist. I think that the tagline for the alchemist is that it is a pretty neat utility option. Yeah. It's, it's got a lot of utility and support in there and a creative player can find ways to bolster and amplify the party in meaningful mm -hmm. ways. I, I think it's cool. I think it would have been really cool if the alchemical concoctions upscaled by using higher level spell slots. And it feels like something that should have been able to scale in some way, shape, or form. Next up, we come to the brand new subclass that was introduced in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. For all of you out there wanting to live your Iron Man fantasy, we have the Armorer. <laughs> Like all artificers, you're going to get tool proficiency in Smith's tools right away when you take the subclass, but you're also going to gain proficiency in heavy armor, which is really key for the other features that come with the rest of the subclass. When we look at the spell list for the armorer, I have two things to say. One, this is one of the best spell lists <laughs> I've seen. Uh, number two, it almost is nonsensical how good it is. Some of the choices here, I don't really associate with the flavor of an armorer. But I'm not going to argue with that because there are great spells on this list. This spell list is amazing. It has Magic Missile and Thunder Wave. It has Mirror Image, Hypnotic Pattern. I don't understand why that's there. You know, I think we can just imagine that our armor has like all of these... Maybe it shimmers it's, magically. May, may, maybe. It's got Lightning Bolt. It's got Greater Invisibility. Again, I can understand. That's a, like a stealth suit yeah. function. Um, and it has Wall of Force and Pass Wall. I give it a 10 out of 10. Yeah, even the niche spells here, like Passwall, you know how many times in a campaign I wish I had packed Passwall, but it's hard, it's a hard spell to take yeah. because it's only useful in niche, but now it's here. And so when you need Passwall, you got it. And so even the niche spells on this list are ones that I love having. There is not a single dud here, which is, is, is really impressive. Like Shatter and Fire Shield are also great spells. So everything here is good. At third level, you gain Arcane Armor, which is, the again, the bread and butter of the Armorer. Now, you can touch a suit of armor that you're wearing and turn it into your Arcane Armor, which now gains a bunch of benefits. These benefits include that you can now ignore the strength properties required for the armor. The armor cannot be removed against your will. The armor is also your spellcasting focus, and you can put it on, or you can put it on and take it off as an action, no matter how long it would normally take. Also, if you are missing any limbs, the armor can replace those limbs, which actually gives you a really cool uh, sort of element to play around with, where now you can live out your Winter Soldier fantasy or your uh, Agent Venom fantasy. So there's there. Obviously, I'm pulling a lot on comic books here, but there's a lot of ideas out there that you could play into with your armor. In addition, you get to define what armor model your armor has, which can either be the Guardian or Infiltrator model of the armor. Both of these are going to give your armor an interesting attack that you can do, which is a melee attack for the Guardian version and a ranged attack for the Infiltrator version. And what's cool about this is that you can use your spellcasting ability in, as intelligence instead of strength or dexterity for the attacks that you make with these gauntlet or chest mounted weapons, whatever you kind of imagine that to be. So 
kind of hidden in the text here is saying, you get to use your spellcasting ability mod to make melee and ranged attacks with your armor weapons. What's interesting about this is that with the infiltrator model, it is a ranged weapon attack, even though it does elemental damage. You apply your ability score modifier to the attack and damage rolls, and you can actually use that with a feat like sharpshooter, <laughs> which is kind of cool. Although it's a one-handed weapon in the case of the um, in the case of the guardian armor. So you're not gonna be able to use that with say Great Weapon Master, but you could still use it with a shield. Both of them have additional properties beyond that as well. Um, in the case of the Guardian Armor, um, if you hit someone with the melee attack, they actually have disadvantage on all attacks that they make, except attacks against you. And you get temporary hit points from the Guardian Armor. Whereas the Infiltrator Armor is gonna increase your speed and give you advantage on stealth checks or negate the disadvantage of stealth that, that normally comes with that armor. Um, you can change this each day as well. So you get the flexibility. You don't have to choose or commit to which model your armor is. If the situation demands you be an infiltrator or the situation demands that you be the um, tank, basically, you can change that out, which is awesome. This little option to be able to choose with a bit of foresight means that your armorer gets to be prepared for any situation that might come in front of them. At level five, you're gonna get extra attack, so you can attack twice instead of once when you make a weapon attack. This applies to the weapon attacks that you make using your armor, so you can shoot twice with the infiltrator uh, shock gauntlet, or you can punch twice with the uh, guardian thunder gauntlets. At ninth level, you gain armor modifications, and now all the parts of your armor are considered to be separate for the sake of infusions. You now have your helmet, your chest plate, your gauntlets, your weapons, your boots. And not only that, but you now gain two additional infusions on top of the amount you already have, which have to be used on your armor, but you're probably going to be wanting a few infusions on your armor anyway. This ability really amps up what the Artificer can do because the infusions are kind of the main thing that the Artificer gets to play around with. And now you get to power your armor up in really cool and unique ways. This also comes with a lot of extra flexibility because at ninth level, when this feature comes online, Artificers can only actually have three infusions active at once, but they know far more than that. So this means that now not only can you have go from three to five active infusions, Two of those infusions always have to be on your armor, but you don't have to stack up all the infusions on yourself. You could do that if the situation demands it, but it now means that you have greater flexibility to make sure that you have some infusions for yourself, but also can be giving them out to your other party members' items as well. This is pretty potent. At 15th level, you gain perfected armor. This adds an additional benefit depending on whether you're using the guardian or the infiltrator armor. With the guardian armor, if an enemy ends their turn within 30 feet of you, you can force them to make a strength save or you can kind of scorpion get over here and drag them 30 feet towards you and make a melee attack against them as part of the reaction. You can use this ability a number of times per day equal to your proficiency modifier and the maximum size of the creatures that you can pull with this ability are huge or smaller. You can't pull a guardian gargantuan creature using this power. And with the Infiltrator, you also gain a pretty cool ability that I kind of feel works like uh, Fairy Fire Light. If you hit a target with your lightning launchers, they now glow and have disadvantage on attack rolls against you, and the next attack against them has advantage. And if that attack against the target hits, it receives an extra 1d6 lightning damage. What's really potent about this power is that this happens every time you damage someone with your lightning gauntlets. So because you can make two attacks per turn with your lightning gauntlets thanks to extra attack, you can actually be sending out this advantage and disadvantage twice per turn. I've got to say that the armor checks all the boxes for me. I think that this is exactly what I pictured when I thought of an artificer and allowing the artificer to build the suit of armor and continue to enhance and build upon it. Not only that, but the versatility of the two different suits of armor that you get to choose from and the fact that you can change every time that you take a rest. The abilities stack up really nicely. As you level up, I feel like this subclass gets more and more potent at what it's advertising it delivers. I honestly think that this is not only my favorite Artificer subclass, it is one of the most inspiring subclasses to me in the game. Uh, that is a little bit biased on my part, but I can't 
I can't discredit the fact that every time I read this subclass, I get 101 ideas for characters that I could play using this. I get excited about all the abilities presented here. There isn't a single element of this subclass that I feel isn't great or, or better. So I think that this is the S tier of the Artificer subclasses. I think that a lot of the Artificer subclasses are great, but I think this one just pushes a little bit further on what we want the Artificer to be amazing at. And it's collaboration between the armor and the infusions, I think really speaks to how it amplifies the core class features of the Artificer. I think that this builds on everything the Artificer has at its core in really meaningful ways. I totally agree with you, Kelly. I think this is an absolutely S tier subclass. And I think the key thing here is the ninth level feature that is giving you two extra infusions to put on top of that. This is just adding a really large amount of flexibility combined with a truly amazing spell list. I think that you have an opportunity with the Armor Artificer to go in a lot of different directions with your Artificer, which is really saying something. If you want to build a melee combatant or a ranged combatant with the Artificer, your spells and feats and infusions can take you in that direction. If you want to build this character as a little bit of a frontline tank, I think that you can do that. It's really going to depend on how your ability scores and your other attributes shake out, but you have that flexibility. And at the same time, even if you build your Artificer armor in one specific direction, you have the ability to just swap everything out and build a new suit of armor if the adventure demands that. So this, you're not even in danger of over-specializing because you have really good features that you can pull in the other direction if such a thing is even necessary as well. I think that the flexibility afforded by being able to use all of your infusions on yourself and gaining additional ones and stacking them up, or alternatively sharing them with your party member. I think one of my biggest gripes actually with the Artificer was it felt like there, it was so limited the number of infusions you could have in play. I remember making lists of being like, oh man, I really want to be able to have this infusion, this infusion, this infusion, but I'd love it if I had an extra infusion to give out to a party member. And this subclass solves that problem. I think that this subclass overall does something that we've we've talked about the flaws of many subclasses through our videos. And I think what's important here is we talked about how um, versatility in key moments can be important, but if there's too much versatility, sometimes it can be a hindrance. However, you also want a class that builds on the core mm -hmm. in a meaningful way, and that if you do specialize, uh, it's it's this weird combination here where you get this specialization of pushing the core artificer forward while still giving you bits of versatility to adapt and change to whatever is presented to you in the situations yeah. before you. And, and let's put it this way. This subclass could make life way harder on you. Like one of the biggest things that I missed on my first reading of the subclass, but then I saw was that the armor lets you use your intelligence modifier instead of strength or dexterity for the attack and damage rolls with it. And it's just that small little thing like that that saying, hey, hey, don't worry about having to spread your ability scores out. Don't You don't have to worry about, you know, the balance between your intelligence or strength and dexterity. You can just put it all on intelligence and have a really good constitution score and not worry about what your strength or dexterity is, is a pretty big benefit. Um, it's, it's things like that. It's those little details that mean that there's nothing clunky around the build here. There's nothing that you kind of have to cludge to make it all work. It all works together really, really well. So now we move on to the Artificer who just wants to blow things up. And this is the Gun-Toting Artillerist Artificer. So in addition to gaining proficiency in Woodcarver's tools, the Artillerist gets a pretty decent spell list. And here's the blowing up part that you're all looking for. The Artillerist gets spells like Shield, Scorching Ray, Shatter, Fireball, Ice Storm, Wall of Fire, Cone of Cold, and, of course, Wall of Force. This is a pretty great Evoker Blaster spell list with a couple really good control spells in the form of Wall of Fire and Wall of Force. I really like this spell list. It's a lot of fun, and you also get Shield in there, which is an amazing defensive spell. At third level, you're also going to gain your Eldritch Cannon. This is a very long-winded ability, so I'm gonna to try to summarize it as best I can. 
generally what this boils down to is you can create a little artillery cannon that either can be held or can walk around on its own. You get three options for what type of cannon it is. Either a flamethrower, a force ballista, or a protector. So depending on what needs you have, I would probably lean more towards the force option most of the time, but the other two options could be pretty cool in certain situations. As a bonus action on your turn, you can have the little cannon move around. It can walk, or it also has a climbing speed, so it can go on walls or ceilings as well. And on top of that, not only can it move, but it can also fire as a bonus action. So your bonus action, you just get a little contraption that can run around the battlefield and deliver extra damage to your enemies or protect you. Yeah, it's a respectable shot too. The Force Ballista does 2d8 points of force damage to a target within 120 feet of it, which is great. And it uses your uh, spell attack modifier to do this. So it's always gonna be based on however accurate you are as a spellcaster. Keep in mind that your cannon does have AC and hit points, so it can be destroyed. However, I'm definitely building this thing to be a little R2-D2 that follows me around. <laughs> like, 100%, it's my droid buddy. Yeah, it's pretty slow, and it lasts for one hour, or unless you dismiss it, and you can only have one active at any one time, but you can always expend a spell slot to create a new one. So even though the initial one, uh, once you create it, only lasts for one hour, if it does get blown up or destroyed or you need it for longer than an hour, you can just use any one of your spell slots, even a first level spell slot will do, to build a new one. At fifth level, you gain Arcane Firearm. Now the Wander Staff that you have is transformed into a magical firearm. This can be used as a spellcasting focus, and when you use it to cast Artificer spells, it now does an additional 1d8 damage of whatever the damage type of the spell was. So as an example of this, if you're a fifth level Artificer and you have the Firebolt Cantrip and you shoot it through your Arcane Firearm, your Firebolt Cantrip does 2d10 fire damage plus an extra 1d8 fire damage, and then you can use your bonus action to fire your force ballista. Not a little bad damage dealing loop there. Your damage dealing is actually augmented a little bit further at 9th level when you gain the explosive cannon class feature. Not only does this add an extra d8 to all the damage that your eldritch cannon does, as an action you can force it to explode in a tw which causes damage in a 20 foot radius. Creatures within it have to make a saving throw against your spell save DC. It's a dexterity save or they take 3d8 force damage. After which of course you can create a new cannon but you know, you better be using this for a good purpose because it, it takes an action to do this damage and it is going to take your cannon out for the rest of the fight. At 15th level, you gain Fortified Position. Now, if you or your allies are within 10 feet of your cannon, you gain half cover. Not only that, but you can now create a second cannon and control both of them with your bonus action. The damage output doesn't end up being too bad here. 68 forces damage from the two force ballista attacks works out to roughly 27 force damage if they both hit. And if you're just throwing your own cantrips, that's also gonna be some pretty decent damage there as well. Also considering that none of this uses any of your concentration. So if you do wanna drop a spell like Wall of Fire, which is on your spell list, or start throwing fireballs, I think you've got a pretty decent blaster in the entire package. I don't think by any means is it the most jaw-dropping blaster in the game. I don't think so, but I think it gives stuff like a Warlock a pretty close run for its money in terms of the amount of force damage it can throw around, and it's got some interesting utility in the other infusions and everything else available. Um, I'm not certain it is the best blaster in the game. I think, this again, it suffers from the Artificer's base level slow spell progression. There, there's actually nothing in here that says you are good at shooting a crossbow yourself. Your force ballista is pretty cool, but if you pick up a firearm, you actually would need to invest in your own dexterity score and you don't get, get any, anything like extra attack. So I think that what the overall artillerist is actually encouraging you to do is to kind of be like this gunnery commander that has your ballistas lined up. You're like an artillery captain with your ballistas and then you're using your spells and cantrips to be the artillery rather than you yourself carrying a gun of some kind. I, I do think that it's cool that the wand or staff that you have kind of becomes a gun and does additional damage. So you do have the feeling of being mm -hmm. a gun-toting wizard. Yeah, so overall, like if you're looking at your average cantrips here and everything hitting, you know, if you're casting a spell like Ray of Frost or Firebolt and getting the extra bonus from Arcane Firearm and firing the two shots from your ballista, 
you've got basically this this damage dealing loop that you can do reliably round after round after round after round that deals about 10d8 damage which works out to roughly 45 damage on average and that's at will damage assuming all the attacks hit which you know even if you're hitting 65 percent of the time not, not too bad the fact that that's not requiring any concentration from you that you could be adding another spell on top of all that finding another way to deal more damage on top of that i think you've got a pretty decent damage dealer out of this is it the best range dan damage dealer no i think that you're gonna fall pretty short of say what a dedicated archer could pull out at least in terms of single target damage but you're bringing things like fireball and wall of force at the same time i'm a little bit on the ba fence here but i i think i'm leaning a little bit more towards like an a minus i don't think it I, I think i would rather play this than the alchemist i'm gonna push you into the a because i i mean again i might be biased because this is the artificer i played for a two shot that is that that is and i thought jerry riggs was a cool character i thought you did great damage with 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 it and i i had so much fun yeah and i the artificer is doing this really important thing for dungeons and dragons actually and i i, I just want to point this out that the artificer is actually advertising reflavoring mm. which is something we've talked about instead of you having to think like oh how does my cleric cast their spells the artificer in both the armorer and the uh, artillerist, the artillerist is saying, hey, imagine that all of your spells are being blasted out of a cannon yeah. and imagine what that yeah. feels like. And that's a really cool vibe to have where you're like blasting cone of cold out of your big arm cannon or whatever. Like, it's so cool. And I do think that this is an excellent blaster. I, I think that to fault any of the subclasses for the slow progression of spells is kind of also comparing it to other classes a bit within the context of what it is it is a half caster mm -hmm. and for being a half caster and in the context of just if we remove all other classes and just look at the artificer this is the blaster artificer and it is the best blaster artificer i think this is an a subclass and again all the elements here really feel like they gel well together uh, you have these cannons at your side. You have your own cannon. You're yelling at your two R2-D2s to shoot force blasts at your enemies while you put up a wall of force at very high levels. Um, I, I love the vibe here, and I do think that this is an A mm. subclass. It's a very strong blaster, but the Artificer in general is a really strong utility and support character. So adding the blaster on top of your utility and support options, because you still have your infusions and things like that, um, this is a well-rounded character that can actually excel in several different play styles. The armorer, if they are taking sharpshooter, they're taking that minus five penalty to their attack rolls, whereas the artillerist has a lot of damage coming from a lot of attacks um, and doesn't have that big penalty to the attack rolls. So there's an opportunity there, potentially, depending on what spells you're, you're doing. I think you could see comparable damage output from both of them yeah I, I do think that the artillerist uh in the same way that the armor does but also slightly different uh adds this element of both specializing but also giving you mm. versatility yeah there's a lot of different places that your damage can come from and you actually don't need to pour out damage if you don't want to you could be using your spell slots for utility and support purposes while you still have two turrets that are blasting enemies so you actually get this sort of versatility in your play style where you can always be outputting damage but also your spell selection and the way you choose to use it allows you to kind of meld into different places in the battlefield or in the situations presented while still being a cool blaster so I don't know. I think it's a strong subclass. I think it's an A. Next, we come to the Battlesmith. This protective guardian has a guardian of their own in the form of their magical steel defender and takes to the field with this arcane construct uh, at their side, giving a little bit of a Beastmaster sort of feel, but of a mechanical sort. Right away, uh, when you take up the subclass, just as before, you're going to get proficiency in Smith's tools and you're going to get the expanded spell list. Now, the Battlesmith has an interesting expanded spell list in the fact that it actually has a bunch of the Paladin Smite spell, spells, like Branding Smite and Banishing Smite, but also some of the other Aura spells, um, such as uh, Aura of Vitality and Aura of Purity. You also get Shield. 
I will say that I think this spell list is really unique and a cool thing to see added to the Artificer, although it doesn't excite me as much as mm. uh, the armor or the Artillerist spell selection. Yeah, the shield and the smite spells are cool. Conjure Barrage is kind of an interesting choice as well. You also have Fire Shield on here. I think I give it like a 4.5 or a 5 out of 10. That overall. seems fair. Yeah, yeah. Also a third level, you're going to gain the battle ready ability. You now have proficiency with martial weapons. And if you are equipped with a magical weapon, you get to use your intelligence modifier for your attack and damage rolls. And this works whether it's a ranged or melee weapon. It just has to be a magic weapon, but it could be a magic weapon that you create with one of your infusions. Also at third level, you're gonna get the Steel Defender. This is your magic battle puppy that follows you in the, in the battle. It actually has a stat block uh, of its own uh, and you can command it and control it as a bonus action. It uses kind of the more sophisticated and updated wording, which I think is quite, the, the comparison to the Beastmaster Ranger is actually quite apt here because it really feels like a fully well-developed animal companion that has a set of restrictions on what it can do if you don't command it. But essentially, you're gonna be using your bonus action most turns to command it, to force it to attack. It shares your initiative count, uh, and if you don't command it, it just dodges. If you're incapacitated, it does decide what to do on its own. Um, and it's got some interesting attacks behind it. Its main attack is a force empowered rend, which works on your game statistics, and it is an attack which deals 1d8 force damage itself. But it also has a really interesting reaction that it can use that imposes disadvantage on, on someone attacking someone other than itself. So it is very much a steel defender in that it will kind of go around on the battlefield protecting either you or your allies by imposing disadvantage on your enemy's attack rolls. Its hit points scale up. It's pretty quick at 40 feet. I think it's a pretty robust creature and you can repair it with the mending spell as well. At ninth level, you gain Arcane Jolt, which is sort of a variation on a smite, where now if you hit something with your magical weapon or your Steel Defender hits something, you can do 2d6 extra damage or you can do 2d6 healing to a creature within 30 feet. It's a little bit of extra damage and you can only use it once per turn. You can't stack this and have you apply it on both your attacks in one turn and your Steel Def Defender benefit from it. So Smite Light. At 15th level, you gain Improved Defender, which gives a number of benefits to overall bolster your defender's properties. First of all, your Jolt goes up to 46 damage. Your Steel Defender now has a plus two to their AC. And when your Steel Defender uses their reaction ability to deflect an attack, the attacker now takes 1d4 plus your Intelligence modifier in damage. This is a pretty nifty subclass, and I quite like it. I think that the versatility that you get proficiency with martial weapons, and as long as it's a magic weapon, you can use your intelligence modifier with it, is great. So it means that, again, you've got a great character here that is a vehicle for great weapon master or sharpshooter. If you want to use two-handed weapons, if you want to do weapon and shield, like any of the concepts that you have for a character that fights in melee or ranged and has a pet will work here. Because all of these abilities don't really drive you towards any one type of weapon. I think the only thing that I'm really missing here is proficiency in heavy armor because you're not going to you might not invest in your dexterity, you might not invest in anything else so it's kind of, it kind of does make me wonder where your armor class is going to shake out with with this whole thing but you got your shield defender to protect you. So I think this is quite good. I think that you could end up with a very interesting utility character and mo most readily again I would compare this to like an arcane beastmaster. <laughs> Ranger. It's again, I know we try to avoid that comparison, but I think it's pretty good if you think about it in that way and, and that's the what you expect from it. And I think that it would be a lot of fun to play. Yeah, I, I fully agree with an A. This is probably my, it goes back and forth between whether this is my second favorite or the Artillerist is my second favorite. Yeah. But I actually feel like this is slightly of a stronger subclass than the Artillerist but slightly weaker than the armorer. And I mean, again, we shouldn't compare it to other classes, but I do think it needs to be said that this is kind of a variation on the Beastmaster Ranger yeah. for somebody who doesn't want to play a Beastmaster Ranger. Luckily, Tash has f fixed the Beastmaster Ranger as well. But what we get here is 
the more magical, yeah, the arcane beastmaster. Yeah, yeah. And it's really cool. It's a really cool vibe. I love having a pet in D and D. Yeah, so I I think this subclass is awesome. I I do think that it is missing a few things that I would have liked to see here. Like you said, uh, I feel like a lot of the attention goes to the uh, steel defender. And you're kind of left just being a basic artificer, but luckily you have a cool pet. So that is kind of the thing. Mm -hmm. But I wish there was a little bit more to make you feel like you could be on the front lines with your Steel Defender. Yeah, that's true. But uh, I'm happy to give this an A. I, I Even if I'm trying to find things to not like about it, the fact is that I love this subclass as well. And as we come to the end of all of these subclasses, I think the Artificer is really well designed. I think it's a very well designed class and the subclasses presented here are really cool. Yeah, I, I don't think that there is any one subclass that I would call out amongst these for being a dud. And even though I think the armor is stronger than the other ones overall, I don't think that it stands head and shoulders over the others. I think it is very, very close in all these and I think that there is a compelling reason to play any of them. The only one that I don't think I would consider playing myself would be the Alchemist. If somebody told me that I had to play an Alchemist, I would have a blast doing mm -hmm. it. But if I was choosing, I would choose the Armorer. The Artillerist is probably my second favorite for flavor purposes. The Battlemaster and then the Alchemist. So that's kind of my, my scale yeah. in my head. But really, they're all compelling. They're all really well designed. Mm -hmm. And I think that we move like it's B+. Plus to S minus is kind of the scale here. Um, and really all of them have ways to push forward in meaningful ways and don't have a lot of detriments. So up on screen right now, you're going to see the rankings that we have given the Artificer subclasses. Now there's a new question that we put in our poll asking who has played these subclasses. So now up on screen, you're going to see how many people have actually played these subclasses who contributed to our community poll. So in our Tasha's community poll, we had over 5,000 people respond and fill out the survey when, when it first went up. Of those people, what we saw is that 487 or 9.5% had played an alchemist. 867 have played an ar armorer. 705 or 13.8% have played an artillerist. And 769 have played a battlesmith. I find the popularity of the subclasses interesting in light of the way we rank them. <laughs> I also agree that, that viewing this in this way and looking at which ones were most popular is kind of another thing to take into account on how well these were received. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the people who are more excited to play a certain subclass saw something great within that subclass. But how did they rank them? Let's take a look. So first up, we have the Alchemist, who gets a 3.6 for S tier, a 23% for A tier, a 46% for B tier, 21% for C tier, and only 5% for D tier. Uh, this is massively landing in the B tier category, which kind of agrees with what we had said anyway. Uh, it's kind of divided very clearly on whether it got C or A tier as well, which again means that this lands perfectly in the middle of the road in terms of subclasses. Now, the armor, on the other hand, got the most S tier rankings of any artificer subclass, with 29.4% of respondents giving it an S tier ranking, and 45% giving it an A, with only 216 giving it a B, 36 giving it a C, and such a small sliver of people giving it a D tier ranking, it's not even worth putting it on the chart. <laughs> Yeah, again with the Armorer, it's interesting that it lands safely in the A category, but it should be noted that it is the highest S tier that we saw in any of the Artificers. For the Artillerist, we see 14.9, but 15% of respondents give it an S tier, and 51.5 give it an A. 29.7 gave it a B, and 3.4% gave it a C tier, again with a sliver for the D tier ranking. Very solidly landing the Artillerist in the A tier, with a very high proportion putting it there, with the next highest being B. So this is definitely a sort of an A- minus sort of ranking here. When we move on to the Battlesmith, it gets a 23% for S tier, 50% on the dot for A tier, a 23% for B tier, and 3.3% for C tier, and again, negligible D tier. What's really interesting is the Alchemist actually gets the highest amount of D tier, the rest 
nobody thought that they were D tier. And I think that says something. The Battlesmith very much lands in an A tier, uh, but it should be noted that it is the second highest S tier. Looking through the community responses and the comments that we got on this, on this, many people shared the sentiment that we had as well, which was that the Artificer subclasses are very well balanced against each other because as we see, looking at the community ranking, almost everything gets an A, <laughs> except for the poor Alchemist who gets a B. And I, I think it's a, it's a pretty resounding consensus that actually bears out both in the number of people who have said that they played the class and the way that they were ranked, especially when we go past just the A ranking and see that the Armorer got a significantly higher proportion of S tier rankings compared to the other ones. So I think what this says overall is that you're gonna have a good time no matter what Artificer you play. They're all really well constructed and really well designed subclasses with the Armorer being a little bit stronger perhaps and the Alchemist being a little bit more, I would say the Alchemist's biggest weakness is really, it's not flashy. It pulls you back down into the support role and not in a mind blowing way that we might see with some of the other um, S tier support characters. When we look at the Artificer overall, it had the benefit of being the newest class added into Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition, which means that it came in after the initial humps of figuring out what worked and what didn't work in 5th edition. So what we actually see here is what I would consider a blueprint for things moving forward in 5th edition. I, I completely agree. Every class should be should feel like this yes right we we should not see the variants that we see with the other classes where they have like a tier and d d tier and s tier stuff everything really ideally every class should be like this if every class in the game was an a tier then that would be a perfect game yeah. it's impossible to achieve that but i think that the artificer is the closest we've gotten to a like it's the best balance mm. I think the biggest thing here is that we see even with classes like the with subclasses like the battlesmith and the armorer we see these little quality of life improvements like we see things in the those two ones specifically they're both the ones that get you extra attack and they also will say hey you don't have to go through that rigmarole of figuring out which ability score is supposed to be your most important one it's intelligence still don't worry about your strength or dexterity for this class. Intelligence and constitution are the thing that you care about as an artificer. And those tiny little quality of life improvements that make the ability score breakdown really clear, that make the play style really clear, that support the flexibility while still giving you room for creativity, really makes the artificer sing. So up on screen right now, you're going to see our final rankings for the subclasses. And next to that, you will see the community rankings for the subclasses. Again, I feel like we're all in agreement here that the Artificer is awesome, and if you're going to play one, then you're going to have a great time. So this has been a look at the Artificer subclass tier rankings in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. Tell us about your thoughts on the Artificer subclasses in the comments below. The videos that we create on our channel are made possible thanks to the incredible generosity of our Patreon supporters. If you enjoy the work that we create here on YouTube, please consider joining our community by following the links in the description below. Also, we are making a book. Dungeons of Drakenheim season one of our live play campaign is coming to Kickstarter. We've partnered with Ghostfire Games to bring this campaign to life as a fifth edition module. You can follow the links below or go to drakenheim.com to join the mailing list so that you're up to date on all the news regarding this Kickstarter. And don't forget to check out our live play Shadows of Drakenheim, which airs Tuesday nights at 6 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash dungeon underscore dudes. You can find all the previous episodes right up over here. And we have plenty more guides to the classes and subclasses of Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you next time in, in the, the dungeon. dungeon.